praise the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in church. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. And welcome to 2019, huh? We made it. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. Before we go into today's teaching, I want to talk to you about some things that uh, the Spirit of the Lord had just prompted me prior to first service about. And, uh, you know, different people respond and respond, have responded and still respond differently to Jesus and to the Word. And where you go to church matters. I believe it matters big time in our life, in your life, in my life. Who, who your pastor is, I think, matters. Um, and what, what you believe, how far you're willing to go in the things of God. And I was prompted this morning, uh, I, I just, this came up in my spirit about the example of Jesus and the disciples when he sends them out into the boat. They go and there's a, there's a storm that comes up as they're going across this body of water. Jesus is praying alone and then he goes to them in the fourth watch of the night, walking on the water. Remember that? The disciples were in the boat. Not just Peter. The disciples, it says. But isn't it interesting that Peter is the one that calls out to Jesus, and he says, if that's you, bid me to come to you walking on the water. Right? You know, there's always one in the crowd, right? <laughs> you know that. Maybe you are that one, right? And I thought this morning, you know, there are a lot of churches around our area that you could go to. I always believe and teach that you go to a church, you go to a church, and you leave a church for only one reason, and it's the same reason. Because the Spirit of the Lord has directed for you to do so. Amen. And I was thinking about Peter this morning and about how he stood up and said, if that's you, bid me to come to you walking on the water. And what did Jesus say? Come. Come. We have a saying that we adopted from Kenneth Copeland Ministries, one word from God can change your life forever. And Peter stepped out of that boat on one word. Something about Peter wanted more than those other disciples sitting in that boat. There was something in that man that wanted to experience things that the other disciples just sat in the boat. They didn't say, you know, they could have said, when Peter said, bid me to come, and bid me to come too. But they didn't. They just sat there. We're going to observe. We're going to sit back. We're going to watch another freak, you know. <laughs> see if he gets his miracle, right? And I believe that this church is full of people who are willing to not just sit back and be comfortable in their Christianity to the degree that, well, well, you know, if it's to happen, it's to happen. You're willing to stand up and say, if that's you, bid me to come. And then step out of the boat. And there's some things that I believe that God's going to have you step out on that you've never thought was possible to do. And there's something that held Peter up. And I believe what held Peter up wasn't the water. Because water in itself doesn't hold people up. But faith will. And so I'm teaching a series I started on Thursday. Typically I teach a series that's Thursday nights. And I teach a different series that's Sundays. I used to teach the same series. And I changed that a few years ago. But this series that I'm teaching on, I started Thursday night, is going to be the same for Thursdays that I'm going to be teaching all the way through on Sundays as well. So if you weren't here on Thursday, I encourage you to get part one of this, um, of what, where we launched out in this. But I'm teaching a series entitled The Fish and the Loaves. Okay? The Fish and the Loaves. 
on October 28th, 2018, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me as I was standing there, and we were right in worship service, and he said that this church is about to experience things on the level of the fish and the loaves. Amen. Now, you don't have to believe that. If you don't want, that's, that's your prerogative, okay? But you do have to believe, you don't have to, but I would encourage you to believe at least that it's in the Bible, and if it's in the Bible, and you believe that that's in the Bible, and you read it and believe that story is true, then you can and have the right to believe for that, experience things like that in your life, right? Because God is no respecter of persons, okay? And just let me remind you that that day, that there was a few fish and a few loaves of bread that fed 5,000 men plus women and children. That was a supernatural multiplication. And I believe in my spirit, this isn't only, um, this isn't talking about necessarily that we're going to feed 15,000 people. We may. I believe that might come out of this, and I'm ready and excited about that. But I believe that there are people who need spiritual nourishment. And what you have in your life is going to bring supernatural multiplication to people's lives through the Spirit and the living Word of God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we come with an open heart and mind to hear and receive of you. Lord, I pray that in any area of our life where we've been ignorant, confused, frustrated, irritated, lacked, lacked knowledge, mis been misled concerning your word, concerning who you are, concerning faith, I pray for great clarity to come by the power of the Holy Spirit this morning to every heart and every life and every mind of every person that listens to this message. No, now, Lord, I ask you to help me that you would think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, that this word would come forth with excellence, integrity, and boldness. Lord, I pray that lives are changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord that I minister this word, not with my ability, but with the ability that you give me through your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you have your Bible, go to Hebrews chapter 11, please. Ooh, that's good. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hebrews 11, verse 1. If you were here on Thursday, you're going to hear some things that I taught on Thursday. Because I want to kind of bring, keep everybody on the same page of music here, if you will, in this teaching. <clears throat> but for us, this church, that means your life, right? Because you and I are this church, okay? For us to experience things, us to experience things on the level of the fish and the loaves, we're going to have to be willing to operate on a level of faith that we have not yet operated in. Okay? Say that again. For us to experience things on the level of the fish and loaves, we're going to have to be willing to operate on a level of faith that we have not yet operated in. Okay? Now, faith is not a new idea. Okay? Faith isn't something new that's just come up. A man didn't come up with the idea of faith. Faith is God's idea. And faith has been around for thousands of years, right? In Habakkuk, you can just, I know you have you in Hebrews, but in Habakkuk 2.4, it says, his, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Say that with me. The just shall live by faith, right? Now, let, let me just show you a few more places here. Romans 1.17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's say it again. The just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11 says, But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, for it is evident. So let's say it again. The just shall live by faith faith. Do you see this reoccurring theme in the Word of God? In Hebrews 10.38 says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So you see this? The just, who is you and I, we've been justified 
through Jesus Christ, we've been made righteous as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The just shall live, how? By faith. By faith. Now, I had you go to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Let's look at this. It says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance. Say, faith is the substance. Faith is the substance. Okay, that's important for you to know. It's important for you to remember. I, I adopted this from a, a minister that I heard say this years ago, and I won't go into the details of it so much today. I did on Thursday, and so listen to that if you get an opportunity. But he made this comment, I heard this man made this comment years ago, and it really just went off on, inside of you. You know, sometimes things are said, it just you identify with it, right? And um, he said that faith is like a tool. And that just clicked on the inside of me, if you will. It just went off on the inside of me because I understood tools to a degree. Uh, I work with tools. Uh, I, I was a mechanic out of high school. And so I have some working knowledge of how mechanical things work. And uh, I'm in the agriculture business. And if you're a farmer, you better know how to use tools <laughs> because you're inevitably fixing something all the time, it feels like, okay? And so... When he said that faith is like a tool, and you can use faith like a tool, you've got to understand that faith being the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. When you need the right tool, quote-unquote, to get the job done, God hands you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the faith necessary to get the job done. And the Spirit of the Lord knows how to hand you exactly the precise tool for the job, meaning he'll give you the exact wisdom, the exact words, the exact things to do on your part to accomplish what is ever set before you. You understand that? So when I say faith is like a tool, meaning in the hands of a surgeon, a surgeon doesn't just have a big old butcher knife, right? They have scalpels. They have multiple scalpels. They have multiple designs of scalpels with angles and so forth, right? Because it is very important that what they do is very purposeful and it is very precise. And I'm telling you, that is just how precise faith is from God. Okay? You don't just bulldoze into things. Oh, I just believe God. I believe that you get quiet. You hear from God. You hear the voice of God here. He gives you instruction. He gives you wisdom. And he gives you what to do. And then you simply act on it. And the faith does the work. Okay? All right. So faith being the substance. Verse 2 says, For by it, meaning faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered up uh, unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, right? Every time you give, every time you sow a seed into this ministry, into another ministry, into someone's life, you do it by... Okay, uh, uh, that was... Uh, you do it by... Faith, right? Lord. Let's look at verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, right? Now we'll come back to that in a minute. We're going to come back to that verse there in a minute. So, we started to look at some things concerning faith last Thursday. And if you're t writing notes, I encourage you to write these things down. Number one, we begin to look at the origin of faith. I'm going to just talk about four things perhaps today if we get there. The origin of faith. Number two, we looked at how we get faith and how we increase faith. How we get faith and how we increase faith. Now listen, if you don't believe your faith increases, that's fine. I've heard, I've heard arguments on both sides, oh, your faith doesn't increase. But will you meet me halfway with this, and it's this. Do you believe that your confidence can increase in the things and the knowledge of the Word if you at least don't believe that your faith 
can increase, all right? And the reason that I personally believe that your faith can increase and can grow is we've been given a measure of faith, but then it's up to us what we do with that measure of faith that's been given to us. And that very example of Peter walking on the water, remember he sank, Jesus reached down, pulled him up. He didn't say, man, Shazam, you got out of the boat. Nobody else got out of the boat. He didn't pat him on the back. He said, oh ye of little faith. Say little faith. faith. Well, Jesus twice said about a man and a woman, different situations, that they had great faith. So if, if Jesus said little faith to Peter, he said great faith to the centurion and that one, and the other woman. To get from little to great, there's a process. In my world, that's how it works. And I call it growth or increase. Okay? Now, where does faith come from? The origin of faith, Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 2, says looking unto Jesus. Say that with me. Looking unto Jesus. It says the author and the finisher of our faith. What other translations say the developer of our faith. So Jesus is the author of our faith. So our faith comes from the Lord, right? Mark 22, uh, 11, 22. I don't have time to go through all the translations, but the Young's literal translation says that And Jesus answered and said to them, have faith of God. I know the King James says in God, but the Young's literal says have the faith of God. Say the faith faith of God. God. That faith comes from him, right? And so the faith that he has, we have. We can operate in the faith that God has. Amen. We're not told to have something that we can't have. He didn't say have the faith of God. You can't really have it, but try. No, he never tells us to try anything in the Bible. Do it. Have faith of God. Okay? Faith comes from God, right? So, number two, how do we get faith? How does it increase? Romans 10, 17, pretty much everyone in here knows this. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, right? How did Peter step out of the boat? Notice he asked Jesus a question. If that's you, bid me to come to you walking on the water, right? Jesus said one word, come. When Jesus said come, there was enough faith in that word for Peter to step out and walk on the water. Faith came. He didn't have the faith to step out on the water until he heard Jesus say come. But once Jesus said come, he had faith. One word from God can change your life forever. So he stepped out on that word, come. All right? How about we looked at this on Thursday, this woman uh, in Mark chapter 5 who had an issue of blood, right? The Bible says, I'll read this quickly, in a certain woman which had an issue of blood, 12 years, say 12 years. 12 years years had suffered many things of many physicians, say many many physicians, and had spent all that she had was nothing better but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she heard of Jesus. Bing! She heard of Jesus. What did she hear of Jesus? What she heard about Jesus was that Jesus was healing people. And when you hear that the healer is in town, something happens, right? And, you know, we jump, it, go, go all the way down, I don't have time to go through all of it. And, he, and, and Jesus said to her, daughter, thy faith has made thee whole, Lord. right? And he said unto her, let's read it together, ready? Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. She heard about Jesus. I said she heard about Jesus. When she heard about Jesus, she said within herself, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. You see what happened? When she heard about Jesus, faith came. Amen? Now, we know this woman had faith already. You say, well, what do you mean? I thought you said faith came when she heard about Jesus. You're right. Faith came in Jesus when she heard about Jesus. She obviously had faith already because she spent all that she had on the physicians. Not everybody goes to the doctor. And not everybody spends all that they have trying to get better. 
Hello? So there was faith, but what happened is when she heard about Jesus, her faith shifted from a natural solution to a supernatural solution. And her faith now wasn't in what a man could do for her, but what God could do for her. In fact, her faith now went directly to the source of all true healing, which is Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, when, when she began, when she heard this, all of a sudden in her spirit, she began to believe that it was possible for her to be healed, for her body to be healed. Say 12 years. She had this issue for 12 years. You may have something in your life that has been along for a very long time. It's been around for a long time, around, and it seems like, ah, oh, just never going to get rid of it. It's just the way it is. Don't fall for that lie. Amen. That's right. This woman had this issue for 12 years. She went to all the physicians. She spent all that she had, but she didn't give up. And when she heard about Jesus, there was a shift in her spirit to now believe in the supernatural power of the healing God. Amen. Amen? And she said within herself, if I may but just touch, she gave herself a point of contact. Amen? Amen. And she touched, Lord. and she was healed, and we just read it together. I had you read it out loud. Daughter, he didn't say my faith has made thee whole. He said your faith has made thee whole. Your faith. Say my faith. My faith. So, I had you write this down on Thursday. If you weren't here, write this down. You know it's faith in God. You know it's faith in God the moment that what you believe has taken you beyond natural expectation. You know it's faith in God when what you believe takes you beyond your natural expectation. Some people say, well, you know, people ask me, if I go to the doctor, am I out of faith? No. You should never go to the doctor in faith alone that the doctor is going to do the work. Every time you go to the doctor, your faith is in Jesus Christ. Amen. It's in his healing power and ability. Don't you dare put that pressure on that physician. He's not even equipped or built to handle that kind of pressure. He or she is doing the best they possibly can for you, but your faith always must rest in Almighty Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the healer. In fact, he is healing. Amen. And so you don't just go, well, I give up. I'm going to the doctor. Thanks, God. We tried. Didn't work out. See you later. No. That's the wrong approach about anything. I mean, you, you can say, take that same approach to business, to life, to the very food you eat, okay? Your trust is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Say, my trust, my trust is, in is in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord. for the blood. For the blood. Thank, you, Lord, Thank you, Lord, for the stripes, for the stripes that, you that you endured so that I, so that I may be healed. May Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, how we receive anything from God is by faith. And without faith, let's go back to Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Right? For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. Amen. Say rewarder. Let me read this in the Amplified Bible. Without faith, it is impossible to please him and be satisfactory to him. But for, it says, for whoever would come near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him out. Amen. Message translation says, anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. Now, I, I, I don't mean to um, hurt anybody's feelings by this um, or be disrespectful in any way, but I just want to use this natural example because I think it, it, it kind of 
gets something in your mind. God is not pleased alone that you believe only that he exists. He is not pleased alone that you only believe that he exists. In fact, the Bible says the devil knows he exists. This verse says that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That pleases God. Right? So my point I wanted to make and why I made that little thing, maybe, you, maybe your natural father on this earth was very absent from your life. Maybe you knew he existed, but he had nothing really to do with you. Never helped you, never came to a soccer game, never came to a recital, never came to your graduation, didn't recognize your birthdays, okay? It's not enough for God for you just to believe that he exists. What pleases him is that you believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Because God does not desire to be an absent father from your life. He desires for you to be very present in your life. And how that happens is by you believing that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You can't blame it all on God and say, well, God, you know, where are you in this? Where are you in this? Where are you in this? He's saying, where's your faith in this? All right. Now, let me shift gears here. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that for by grace you are saved through faith. Right? That not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. I made a comment about our faith and how it grows and how it increases and how we develop our faith. Jesus talked about great faith and Jesus talked about little faith. Now, faith doesn't grow over time. I made this point on Thursday. I'll say it again. Faith doesn't grow over time. Time. I went in a little bit more detail on Thursday, so if you get a chance, listen to that. Time doesn't increase faith. Well, you've been a Christian a long time. I figured you'd believe, you know, you could believe more than me. No, not necessarily. Because faith only grows, to my knowledge, through spiritual knowledge. Faith only grows through spiritual knowledge. Now, the worst way to live life is to live, to, is to allow yourself to live and be in a place where you don't use faith. I'll give you some examples. I can figure it out on my own. I don't need anybody's help. I already know how to be successful. What you're saying is you don't need God. And that is not pleasing to God. Because if we're trying to do everything of our life without faith and without faith in God, then it's not going to please Him. Because we can't do a good enough job. It's really what it ends up being, true reality. The first part of that verse that we read there is that we are to believe that God exists, and the second part was that we are to understand that he is a rewarder. So I'm going to talk about a reward. Go to Luke chapter 5, verse 1, please. Say, God God is a rewarder. rewarder. I told this story in the first service, and I also told it a few months ago. But I didn't tell it quite like this. My daughter was believing God to go to a particular high school. She got accepted into this high school. It's a, it's a Christian private high school. And the day she got ex- accepted to the high school, she was out going for a walk or whatever she was doing. And she saw in the woods this little dog. And this little dog ran over to her. She picked it up. And then she put it on the cart, and she was going down the road in this cart, and a car pulled up to her uh, while she was on the golf cart, and uh, the car stops, and they're like, oh, you know, you know this is going already, right? And you found our dog, you found our dog. And she's like, oh, great, you know, yeah, he just, I saw him in the woods and called him, he came over to me, I picked him up, and I don't know whose dog it was. So she hands the dog to the people, and they're all excited that they got their dog back, right? That could have been it. But they said, did you see our flyers? 
She's like, well, I, didn't see, I didn't see any flyers, you know. There was no flyers around our house where she found the dog. And they said, we put up flyers and we have a reward for our dog. And they handed her a $100 bill. Say reward. reward. Now listen, my daughter didn't know there was a reward. She was willing, and she's like, oh, you don't have to do that. And I said, no, there's a reward. You see, she was unaware that there was a reward, but there was a reward. And when those people told her that there's a reward, now they obligated themselves to produce the reward. God himself committed himself to be a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. All she had to do was put her little hand out and receive that reward. She didn't know it existed, but once it was made known and these people followed through on their character, and what they said they would do, they did. God, who cannot lie, is faithful to reward every person on the planet who diligently seeks him. And that, get this, that is what pleases him. I guarantee you the reason those people said, did you know there's a reward? They couldn't wait to give her that $100 bill because it pleased them to get that little dog. Right. And I'm telling you, it pleases God to reward you. It's his heart of love for your life. I've heard so many people say, well, I pray, but you know, I wouldn't pray for anything for myself. You know, I feel like that's being selfish. You know, I pray for other people's needs, but I don't want to pray for my needs. <laughs> You know, I personally think it is. You just don't have the faith to believe for your need. It's easier for you to believe for somebody else's need. Okay, maybe I'm wrong about that, but <laughs> let's go to Luke 5. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear, to hear the word, to what? Hear the word of God. To what? Hear the word of God. What, what's happening when you hear the word of God? Faith comes, right? And he stood by the lake of Nazareth, and he saw two ships standing in the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their net, and he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and he prayed that he would thrust him out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the ship. What is he doing? He's using a natural PA system, right? Because they're all crowded around him, people in the back couldn't hear, so let me get a little offshore and uh, 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 on the water, and I can speak, and my voice carries easily across the water. If you've ever experienced it, it's really an amazing thing. I was on a boat, there was, uh, on a boat, and there was another boat at least a quarter to a half a mile away, and I could hear them talking like they were 20 feet away. It's amazing with the wind and, and, and the water how a voice can carry across the water. Well, God knows this. He's real smart. Remember that? He knows how to do this. Isn't that something? I mean, that's just the wisdom of God right there, people. Okay, so anyways, he knew how to do it. Now, when he had left speaking, and he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night. Say toiled all night. Toiled all night. Everything in the Bible has revelation. Every time you're in darkness, there's toil. And have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Glory to God. Amen. Now, he could have said, Jesus, with all due respect, you're a carpenter slash minister, teacher now. We're professional fishermen. We know these waters better than anybody. I grew up out here. My dad was a fisherman. I just got done fishing all night. And frankly, I really don't feel like going out again. I just got done washing my nets. Don't really want to get them dirty again and catch nothing and come back. And now I'll be really exhausted. But you got to understand, while he was there washing his nets, 
He was hearing the word. And when you hear the word, what happens? Faith comes. That response, master and nevertheless, was a response of faith that came from him hearing the word. And when he heard that word, even though all his experience, remember what I said, you know it's faith in God when it takes you beyond what your natural expectation is. If anybody had a natural, could have had a natural expectation on what to expect as far as catching fish, it would have been Simon Peter and these guys because this was their expertise. This was their profession, right? But faith launched before the boat launched because he said, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down my net. And what did they do? They let down the net. you got to understand, it didn't please God enough. I, I, I don't get caught up on semantics with this. I just kind of say some things, and maybe I get myself in a little bit of trouble. It wasn't pleasing enough to God for them just to hear the word. He wanted them to hear the word and meet their need. He wanted them not only to believe, but to believe that he was a rewarder. He could have handed them a few bucks, a few coins. Could have handed them a lot of coins. But now, and you know, he he said, you're going to be fishers of men, right? Even though Simon Peter heard these teachings, Simon still had to release his faith by letting down his net, by launching out into the deep. Say that we already read this, but I want you to say it out loud. God is a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him. Say this, I believe both that God exists and that he cares enough for me me. to respond to me me. when I seek him. him. Praise the Lord. Did, did, Did the Lord respond to Simon's faith? He sure did. And when they had done this, verse 6, and when they had done this, say it out loud, and when they had done this, not, not before, when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their net break. And they beckoned unto the, their partners, which were in other ships, that they should come and help them. And they, bo- and they came and filled, what? Both ships, so that they began to sink. It's a lot of fish. <sighs> Glory to God. Simon Peter saw it. He fell down on his knees saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. For he was astonished. And all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. The abundance of fish didn't produce faith. The abundance of fish produced astonishment. The word that they heard The word of God that Jesus was teaching is what produced faith. Well, I'll I'll believe it when I see it. No, you won't. No, you won't. Faith doesn't come like that. Not faith in God. Now, you have a level of faith that you operate in the natural. You say, how do you know that? Because everyone in here is sitting down. And I didn't see anyone in here come, flip the chair over, look for some rating to see how much that chair could hold up, You just sat your derriere down on the seat. So there's a level of natural faith that you exercised in the designer who designed the chair or the engineer and the person who welded the thing together and put it together, put it on a truck, and shipped it here, right? But I'm telling you that your faith in God comes not from seeing this or seeing that. Your faith in God comes from the Word. And you might as well just get over it and accept it. <laughs> Lord. Right? Lord. Praise God. 
now? A couple more minutes, you go okay? Yeah. Even if you said no, I'm going to keep preaching. <laughs> I just like to be courteous, you know. Are you going to eat that last one? Well, I guess not. It's already in your mouth, right? <laughs> Say this. Faith, faith prepares. prepares. Go in your Bible with me to Luke chapter 6, verse 46. You ever heard of a prepper? <laughs> they even did made television shows about these people that are prepping, right? Now, if you're a prepper, just look down in your Bible. That's, that's your prerogative, too. You can let everyone do. But I, I, I want to make this point. If a person can prepare in the natural, a person can prepare in the spiritual. If a person can store up food, if a person can build a bunker, and, and on and on and on. I mean, I found out, I got some friends that are preppers. I didn't know they were preppers. I'm surprised they told me they were preppers, because I think I got more guns than them. But... <laughs> Like, I don't know if you want to tell me you're a prepper, because I ever need anything. I'll just come over. No, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, easy. I can, I can, some people are like, oh, he's one of them, huh? Yeah, I am. That's who I am, all right. Just, gotta love me anyway, right? I said you only leave a church, and you only come to church for one reason. <laughs> Not for the Second Amendment, but okay, all right. <laughs> all right. We can prepare our faith, and we can prepare spiritually, and we should. You say, well, why is that? Well, Luke 6, 46, and why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, well, that sounds like someone who believes that he exists and diligently seeks him, doesn't it? it does him, I will show you whom he's like. He's like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Who's that rock? Jesus Christ. How do we get there? By faith. And we get there by the word of God. But, verse 49, but he that heareth does not is like a man without a foundation building a house upon the earth against which the streams did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Same storm, same stream, one stood, one collapsed into a heap of ruins, right? One prepared. And I'm telling you that we can prepare now our faith for whatever is to come. Okay? Remember in 2 Corinthians where Paul says, while well, we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are temporal, the things that are unseen are eternal, right? The message translation, you can put this up there, message translation says, so we are not, given, we are not giving up. Say that with me. We are not giving up. I know they had a little bit of challenge with this first service getting this. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us. On the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times. The lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today, gone tomorrow. But the things we can't see now will last forever. That's our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? True enough, we're coming to, to the end days. In fact, I believe that we're in the end days. But we don't have to start living, learning how to live by faith after things get hard upon the earth. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, know this that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, we're, we, we've got quite a buffer in this nation, but there are other nations that are dealing with some serious hard times. In fact, there are some people here today from Venezuela, you're dealing with some serious hard times in your nation, right? You see this, the Amplified Bible says, understand this, 
that in the last days will come set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. I don't recommend starting to learn how to live by faith in the middle of the storm because we can start living by faith right now. Faith, if you understand this, Ephesians 6, 16, look at this. It says that above all, above all, above all, take the shield of So faith's a shield. Faith's a shield. Well, yeah, I know faith's a shield, yeah, but learn how to use the shield of faith now for whatever you're dealing with. Well, you know, I don't want to bother God with that. I don't really think it's that necessary. The most dangerous place to be and to live is a life that doesn't require faith or that you don't apply faith in your life. We already read it's not even pleasing to God. Okay? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But we could say, with faith, it pleases God. Right? Listen to the uh, message translation in Ephesians 6.16. Look at that. Be prepared. Say it with me. Be prepared. He didn't say go out and buy half the grocery store and store it in your basement. Or whatever, basement. I don't know what we store here. Some people have basements in Florida. (laughs) Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued. So that when it's all over, but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. I don't worry about the future, and neither should you. I'm going to say that again. I don't worry about my future, and neither should you. A thousand may fall on my side, 10,000 at my right hand, not coming near me. Well, 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 how do you know? I mean, things get real bad. Hey, hey, my faith is in this word. Amen. Right? Amen. Look, listen to this. Truth, righteousness, peace. Look at this next word. Faith and salvation are more than just words. Learn how to apply them. You ever hear that? Learn how to apply them. We've got to learn how to apply the shield of faith. Right where you're at, right now, with what you're dealing with now. He says you'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. Wow! Yeah! God's word is an indispensable weapon. Man, that just gets me excited about run around the room. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your, eye, keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. We have a responsibility to help our brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to meet people in this church. We, on purpose, do that little meet and greet and passing of the peace before I come up here and start ministering, don't we? Do you think it's just like, we didn't know what else to do, so we do that? No. I do that because it's crazy. We're not even that big, and people don't even know who other people are that sit right by them. Get out, shake somebody's hand, try your best to memorize their name, and if you forget it, Go up to them a hundred times and say, I forgot your name again, okay? (laughs) It's okay. Get over it. (laughs) It's okay. 
But if you never make a connection to someone sitting around you in church, how in the world are you going to keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out? How many of you knew, maybe you were one, a dropout in high school, right? Okay, don't raise your hands. Just... <laughs> I said right. I was actually looking for a response, and I didn't mean to ask for a response. <laughs> That was good. You know that person didn't want you to call them and say, hey, come on, let's go. Get back in class. You can do it. Because they had already had this, you know, worked up, and they can't do it, and they're not going to pass anyway, right? And some of you had, you know, a, a guidance counselor or a teacher who encouraged you to stay in school, right? Some of you might have. I'm telling you, this is what we're supposed to do in the body of Christ. But if you can't even get out of your seat and say hello to two people and get to know them a little bit, I didn't say you have to date them. I didn't say you have to take them to dinner. I would just say, say hello. Get to know them a little bit. What are we doing in churches? We can't just file in and file out like a bunch of cattle, Okay. We've got to make some life connections here and encourage our brothers and sisters in the things of the Lord, right? I know, I know some of you are doing this. I know probably a lot of you are doing this. But I'm reminding some of you that aren't doing it, start doing it, okay? Well, I'm not like that. You're going to spend eternity together. Start now, Right? And I, some people, you've got you to gotta love them by faith. You've got to just like them by faith. For real. You think I like every one of you? You've got to do it by faith. I love you. I love you. But y'all haven't been all to my house. Only a few of you have been to my house. I might like you if I got to know you. I don't know, but... But you can get to know somebody. There's somebody in here that you have something in common with. And you got to ask them, hey, what do you do for work? Hey, what do you do? Ask, you got to talk to them beyond hello, hello, hello. <laughs> night, night, Sam. Night, Sam. You know, this is a little <laughs> cartoon back in the day, right? Oh, yeah. you, you, you just got to do that. Why? Be, because, because keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. This church would be literally, Jeff, probably 10 times, maybe even more, what it is today if the people that were here didn't drop out. It's sad how many people just sort of drop out and they don't even go plug themselves into another church. I don't care if you don't go here. I just want you to go to church. I want you to find a church that God's called you to be in, get plugged in, get to know the people, and be a blessing to other people. You see, there is something about this, in this, that prepares your heart. You know, the Bible says, and I I don't go there, I'll maybe get there next week or Thursday, when when the Son of Man returns, when the Son of God returns, you know what he's looking for? Faith. He's looking for faith upon the earth. He's not looking for love, not looking for joy, not looking for peace. (laughs) Looking for faith. That means there's a lot of people whose faith is going to fail. They're going to allow their faith to fail them. Faith in itself doesn't fail, but they're going to give up. We need to encourage each other not to give up. Stand to your feet, please. Did you get something out of this? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hmm. Whew, we got the devil on the run. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Just close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we just thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for being so faithful and so good and so consistent. Lord, we just honor you and praise you with all that we have. Thank you that not only that you want us to believe that you exist, but that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. 
Thank you, Lord, for every man, woman, and child that's here today that is diligently seeking you. Lord, I thank you that we have an expectation to see things happen on the level of the loaves and the fish. In the same way you multiplied that natural food, I pray that the spiritual food of the living Word of God is going to be multiplied through the lives of the people here into their homes, into their communities, into their apartment complexes, into their workplaces, into their schools, into their universities, into their social clubs. Thank you, Lord, that we are going to see a great and mighty wave of your glory and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can't confidently say that you know that you know that you know you're a Christian. You might say, oh, I'm a good person. I'm talking about making the decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart. If you don't know that for sure, as I dismiss the people, I would ask you and invite you to come out of your seat, walk down here and join us. Let us pray with you the prayer of salvation. Or if you'd like prayer in any other area of your life, prayer couples, if you come forward at this time, be available to pray for the people. We are here to join our faith with your faith concerning your miracle. And we see and we expect miracles in this church. We see them take place. They, do, they take place here. Okay? So we'll join our faith with your faith concerning your miracle. Remember, you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Bless going in and bless going out. Everything you set your hand to, you're the lender, not the borrower. You're good looking. You're dismissed.